kind words and i have to specially thank you for allowing me to attend my uh, you know uh, the oration that was I, i was keen to attend because as a dean it was really important for me to attend that uh, you know that uh, oration and you really changed the time so i have special you know i have to give you special thanks for allowing me to do that so thank you very much again uh, the 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 talk that uh, that uh, dr fatima wanted me to give is uh, the indications and timing of surgery in various uh, con- common congenital heart disease however i have taken the liberty of adding cath- catheter interventions to it because uh, some of these uh, common congenital heart disease we can really deal with in the cardiac cath lab without the patient undergoing a knife or or surgery so i would be i have kind of combined both of these and i would be just taking up some common congenital heart disease trying to uh, give the indications and the timing of surgery now my talk is primarily based on uh, this guideline that we had published in 2019 in detail in annals of pediatric cardiology and as you can see these are actually the consensus statements of a number of experts that we had in our own country and uh, this was really uh, based on a meeting that we had in uh, 2018 and then we came up with this publication we've also published similar same guidelines in indian pediatrics that is primarily for pediatrician and in pediatric cardiology was more catering to cardiologists and cardiac surgeons and then for adult cardiology we have published a little edited version of the same guidelines in indian heart journal in 2019 so i would request uh, all of you to maybe go through these guidelines because i think they'll be quite applicable to all the countries in our region including bangladesh pakistan and so on so when we talk of timing of intervention i think we must take three things into consideration one is the natural history of that lesion then is there a benefit of doing an intervention and also what is the risk of that intervention if the natural history is better than the procedural outcome a very classical example being vsd where we know that over a period of time the vsds may close in some cases we should not do anything we should not necessarily intervene also if we think that result of surgery or whatever intervention we are going to do is going to be better is going to make the life of the patient better is going to increase the life span and the quality of life we need to do something and we need to intervene the question is when should we intervene so i am going to take up the these uh, common congenital heart diseases the asynotic group of left to right shunts and obstructive lesion and the synotic group of reduced pulmonary blood flow that is tetralogy of fallows and uh, a little bit about the transposition etc which are condition which are present usually in, uh, in infants and neonates so let's come to left to right shunts the first defect that comes to our mind is that of atrial septal defect and as you can see here it asd could be located in so many places in the atrial septum the commonest of course is secundum atrial septal defect the one over here which is almost 80% of cases would have a secundum asd so as i said when we look at the the timing of intervention we need to see the site of defect the age at presentation does patient have any symptoms another very very important factor that comes in congenital heart disease is the pulmonary arterial hypertension how big is the asd is it producing problems or is it just a small pfo should we intervene or not what is the natural history of that lesion and if there are any comorbidities so conventionally all hemodynamically significant atrial septal defects which i would say where the flow is more than 2 to 1 and there is right ventricular volume overload uh, as can be assessed by echocardiography they all should be closed unless there is a significant pulmonary arterial hypertension and something like an eisenmenger syndrome fortunately eisenmenger syndrome would be very unusual uh, in atrial septal defect so this is what uh, we had given as guidelines when i say class 1 indication class 2 indication this would mean similar to what you are used to seeing in acc recommendations so class 1 is of course very much indicated class 2a is also indicated 2b is equivocal and 3 is of course contraindicated so in a stable child the ideal age of closure is really 2 to 4 years you don't have to hurry and do it in infancy because these children do very well and there is really no need for us to hurry the 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 uh, surgery or intervention in these patients for sinus venosus defect we generally say that we should uh, wait for a little while simply because sinus venosus defects can produce uh, when you operate on them they can produce some amount of obstruction to the superior vena cava so i think most of the surgeons are very comfortable operating on a child who is more than 12 15 kg so generally we would like to wait a little longer for the sinus venosus defect however if the patient is symptomatic 
like it may happen in a small percentage of cases that one may have congestive heart failure or even pulmonary arterial hypertension in an ASD. Very unusual, but occasionally we do come across some such cases. I think the onus is on us to rule out any uh, associated lesions which might be producing this congestive heart failure. And the commonest things that we often miss could be, you know, it may not be ASD at all. It may be total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. And then, of course, the diagnosis changes. Or there may be some obstruction to the left ventricular inflow, for example, mitral stenosis or pulmonary vein stenosis, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have ruled those things out and still you believe that child is symptomatic only because of ASD, then one has to close it earlier, maybe in infancy itself. Many of these patients of ASD are so asymptomatic, they don't come to us at all. And, you know, they are diagnosed at the age of 18, 20, 25 years, simply because they never had any symptoms. Their findings were very subtle and therefore they were missed. When they're going to college or when they're going for any job, then somebody hears a murmur and then they come to us. Again, there is no question about it. All the hemodynamically significant ASDs, which have RV volume overload, should be closed. As long as one is certain that pulmonary artery pressures are within normal limits or the pulmonary vascular resistance is within the operable range. And very occasionally we end up operating or let's say closing the foramen ovale in elderly people also or even in young 40, 45 year old person who comes with a history of a transient ischemic attack or a stroke of unknown origin. And then you find that there is a PFO or a patent foramen ovale which is shunting right to left occasionally, maybe during Valsalva. And these are the cases of cryptogenic stroke where you may want to close uh, the PFO or the patent foramen ovale. The method of closure, I think we all are familiar that surgery is the way of closing AST. It's been there for, you know, from 1950s. It's an established mode. It's very safe surgery, absolutely negligible morbidity and mortality. But now for the last maybe three decades, we have devices which have come specifically for fossa ovale AST. I wouldn't say that they should be used for other sites of ASDs, but for fossa ovalis ASDs, which are central defects, which have adequate rims all around, and the child is a little bigger, and the defect is not very large, one can go ahead and do device closure. You know, there are multiple devices that are available to us, but generally one likes to use one of these uh, you know, centering devices, like an AGA or a LifeTac kind of a device. I'm sure you have them all uh, available in your country as well. Now, coming to ventricular septal defect, which is very, very common uh, congenital heart defect in, in uh, I think the commonest acyanotic congenital heart defect, I would say, again, it could be present in many, any location as shown here, and there could be one or there could be multiple defects. Again, one needs to look at the age of the child when he's presenting, the size of the defect, hemodynamic severity, is it a large defect or a small defect, what is a pulmonary artery pressure, where is it located? It is important because muscular VSDs tend to close more often than perimembranous VSDs. So in a muscular VSD, you may like to wait for a little longer for to have a spontaneous uh, reduction in size. If the patient is symptomatic, you may have to deal with it early. And of course, the natural history. So when we look at the natural history of VSD, it has a very interesting course in most patients. But what we are interested in is spontaneous decrease in size and closure of the VSD. And this is seen in as many as 35 to 40 percent of patients born or children born with VSD. So it is not an unusual phenomena. Some people believe that muscular VSD, the spontaneous closure may be as high as even 80 percent. So overall, I would say about 35 to 50 percent of VSDs will close with the time and therefore we should not hurry in closing them unless patient is caught up and the patient is symptomatic or is developing pulmonary arterial hypertension. So I'm just going to maybe for the sake of you know, interest show you two comparative cases. This is the case one, who's a four month old child with history of recurrent lower respiratory infections. Mother feels that the child is tachypneic. There is a history of suck, rest, suck cycle. That means patient, the baby gets very dyspneic or very distressed after feeding and tends to leave feed in between. There is history of diaphoresis on the head history of poor weight gain, but no cyanosis. On the other hand, this is another patient of VST only, who's a 10 month old child, totally asymptomatic, just discovered to have a murmur when went for some vaccination. The mother denies any history of tachypnea or any feeding difficulties, and we, she thinks he's been thriving well. When we look at the examination case one, only four kilogram at four months, so falling into minus 2.8 Z value, tachypneic, tachycardic, hepatomegaly, that means has congestive heart failure, there is hyperdynamic precordium. Second heart sound is wide and variable split with loud P2. And the murmur is not very loud. It's grade two only. 
early systolic, not even pan-systolic murmur along left sternal border, but there is a flow murmur at the apex, suggesting that VST flow is quite large, left to right flow is quite large, but because of pulmonary arterial hypertension, you're not hearing a good VST murmur. Whereas case two, who had a good weight of about seven kg at 10 months, although it is also a little less than what it should be, has no evidence of congestive heart failure. There is only mild cardiomegaly, P2 seems normal, S2 is a little wide variable split, but has a loud grade three over six pan systolic murmur along the left sternal border and has a third heart sound at the apex. So this is the x-ray of the first child. You can see gross cardiomegaly with increased pulmonary blood flow. And if you look at the ECG, again, you have very, very large complexes, the mid precordial lead suggesting of biventricular hypertrophy. So this is a very clear cut case of a large VST. Although the child is four months, but we should not wait because there is congestive heart failure, patient has had LRTI or pneumonia, and patient has a large VST, and therefore patient should be operated early. On the other hand, this is the x-ray of the other child who is 10 months old. There is some amount of cardiomegaly, but not a lot. There is plethora also. Pulmonary artery segment is somewhat prominent, but this fits more like a moderate VST, and therefore I would say at 10 months of age, there is absolutely no hurry. It's likely that the peer pressure is almost normal because there is a loud murmur and one can wait for this VST to close spontaneously. If it doesn't, then one can always, always operate later. Now, this is the echo of the first child. As you can see, there is a large perimembranous VST, which is having absolutely no turbulence across it. So it is going left to right, but look at this. It is absolutely red colored flow, suggesting that there is no turbulence. On the other hand, this is the VST of the other child who's got a VST, which looks quite small. But what bothers me here is this right coronary cusp. The right coronary cusp seems to be getting into the VST, having a prolapse of the VST. And if you put some color, you can see a small VST. The jet is quite narrow. But then there is some amount of aortic regurgitation, which has happened because the aortic valve cusp is prolapsing into the VST, thereby reducing the size of VST, but at the same time also producing aortic regurgitation. So once I see this on echo, then I will have to do something for this child. Otherwise, his AR might progress with time. And then we may have more trouble because of aortic valve not getting repaired fully. So Clinically, what looks like a moderate VST must always be confirmed by echocardiography, whether it is a small VST or a moderate VST, and the, what is the pulmonary artery pressure. Pulmonary artery pressure here was normal. As you can see, it's a very narrow jet with a lot of turbulence here, unlike here, where there is absolutely no turbulence. So this was a moderate VST, all right. But this patient also had prolapse of the right coronary cusp and some amount of AR, which changes the, 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 the treatment modality or the treatment line for this patient. So how do we treat... Uh, patients with VST. If we talk of small children and infants, small VST, no symptoms, normal pulmonary artery pressure, no left ventricular volume overload, absolutely no need, need to close. You should just follow them up. The only reason why you may have to close is presence of aortic regurgitation or infective endo history of infective endocarditis. So if these are present, even a small VST may have to be closed, firstly, to ensure that the aortic valve remains competent. And secondly, if there is infective endocarditis, then it is possible that another episode may happen. And therefore, it is better to close these small VSDs, considering that our mortality of VSD closure is negligible. It's almost zero. On the other hand, if we have a moderate VSD with a little bit of left ventricular volume overload, like our patient had, if the child is asymptomatic, we can wait, 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 see if the VSD closes. If it doesn't, then you can close at maybe three or five years of age, because the likelihood of closure beyond five years is very, very low. So if it is moderate VST, pulmonary artery pressure is almost normal, then you can wait. However, if the patient is symptomatic with failure to thrive with recurrent respiratory infections, then it will be better to give some medications like diuretics. But if the patient is symptomatic, it will be better not to wait too long and close around two years or one year of age. When it comes to large VST, we know that there'll be high pulmonary artery pressure because it is a non-restrictive VST. We try and control symptoms with medications. If we can, then we should wait maybe about six months or five months of age and then close it. But if we feel that patient is not doing well, despite our medication with diuretics or even ACE inhibitors like Keptopril or Enalapril, then it will be better to close the VST even earlier than that rather than waiting and waiting because the child may not gain weight and in the meantime might develop some life-threatening uh, respiratory infection. 
However, when it comes to older patients or adults, then our indications may be a little different. And this is a slide that I have taken from the European Society of Cardiology publication in 2020 of congenital heart disease in adult. And again, you can see that if it is a small VSD, then there is absolutely no need of closure unless there is infective endocarditis or AR. So this part is same as for children. However, if there is pulmonary arterial hypertension, then there is a question about testing their operability and one to take such adults or older patients or older children to cardiac cath lab to test their operability. If we find that, yes, their pulmonary vascular resistance is less than five, some people take a cutoff of six also, and the flow is still large, more than 1.5 is to one, and then there are various ways of assessing the operability in the cath lab, they can go for closure. But if we find that PVR is high, the PVR is not falling much with even pulmonary vasodilators, it is best to leave them alone because if you operate on such sort of borderline or inoperable patient, then actually they may behave worse than if you leave them alone. So any patient of VSD, especially older children or adults, where you suspect pulmonary vascular obstructive disease because of severe pulmonary arterial hypertension, I think it is important that decisions are made on an individual basis and not just based on the echocardiography or cardiac iteration data, but also on their clinical examination, on their X-ray, on their ECG, to see whether they're still shunting adequately left to right, only then think about closing it, provided the PVRI comes less than six uh, wood units. Yes, surgery again remains the preferred method or let's say conventional method of closure of VSD. It has absolutely negligible morbidity and mortality. The, I think the only complication one can expect is complete heart block, which happens in less than 1% of these individuals. Those with perimembranous VSD, it's not a problem with uh, muscular VSD. Sometimes in very small babies, you know, who are, who are not thriving at all, if, if one is not very comfortable putting them on cardiopulmonary bypass, it may be okay to do their pulmonary artery bending, especially if the VSDs are multiple or they are inaccessible. Bend them, wait for some more time, let the child grow. And once the child is, let's say, one or two years of age, one can go back and close the VSD and do the debanding. But right now, I think bending indications have become very few in, in current setup. Something that again, we've started to do more and more is the device closure, but then it is for a very select group of VSD patients. And generally we say the child has to be big, at least more than eight kilogram uh, in weight with a shunt, which should be more than 1.5 is to one. Most often the or most suitable VSD for device is a muscular VSD, which has good rims all around. But sometimes we do VSD closure in residual VSDs also after you know VSD closure. And if we want to do for a perimembranous VST, although it is not a, you know, uh, a great indication, I would say it's more like 2A, 2B, but if we decide to do perimembranous VST, we must make sure that there is some amount of rim or some amount of tissue all around it so that it is not very close to the aortic valve and patients should not develop any aortic regurgitation. Also, when we do perimembranous VSD, one has to be very, very careful about conduction abnormalities. So contraindications, as I said, would be any conduction abnormality or any aortic regurgitation. And we should never try to close device uh, for an inlet or a subpulmonic VSD. Once you've decided to do device closure, once the device has been put in, we should not release the device unless we've checked for any degree of aortic regurgitation for any conduction defect, like a left bundle branch block or complete heart block on any mitral or tricuspid regurgitation. If any of those come up during device closure, it is better to retrieve or to take the device back and not close it with the device. Atrial ventricular septal defects, uh, it's a sort of a combination of ASD and VST and complete AVST usually presents with quite significant uncontrollable heart failure. And most of the time, these patients have to undergo surgery by about two, three or four months of life. However, if they're stable, one can wait for a little longer, maybe at about six months of life, we can close the VSD. For partial AVSD, which is generally a primum ASD, one can do surgery at about one to two years of age. If there is associated significant AV regurgitation, which we know happens with you know, complete AV septal defects sometimes, then that may also necessitate very early surgery. I think one important factor to remember here is that we know AVSD happens with Down syndrome. But what also happens in Down syndrome is that their pulmonary artery pressure goes high and they develop early pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. So Down syndrome patients are better operated even earlier maybe by about three, four months of age, because they tend to develop high PA pressure and high 
pulmonary vascular obstructive disease earlier than normal non down babies ductus it is almost the same story as vst if you have a large ductus with congestive heart failure with severe pulmonary arterial hypertension we should just go ahead and close however if it is a small or a moderate pda one can wait a little longer one important point to remember is that if ductus is only diagnosed in echocardiography and there is no murmur present clinically there is no reason why we should close this vst with this pda why i'm saying is that now with you know so many devices coming so many of us starting to do interventions we are tending to become very aggressive and we try and close any pda that we find even on echocardiography but currently there is absolutely no indication for closing a pda which is silent on auscultation so echocardiographic diagnosis of pda is not enough to close this pda if if the pda has been large and there is severe pulmonary arterial hypertension the child is presenting beyond about a year of life it will be again good to assess them for operability like you do for vst so that you don't operate or you don't close a pda in a child who is inoperable because again that will do more harm than good surgical ligation has been the conventional way of closing however now with transcatheter closure almost all pdas are being closed in the cath lab uh, preterm and term neonates who are very small in weight may still go for surgical ligation and i think another thing we need to remember is if we have a full term newborn if there is a pda indomethacin ibuprofen or paracetamol has no effect and one should not even try but when it is a preterm baby with gestational age of less than 37 weeks or so then one should try and use these drugs like indomethacin ibuprofen or paracetamol provided there is no contraindication generally we like to give two courses of drug therapy but if patient or if the baby is pda is still not closing and it is still hemodynamically significant it may be wise to go for surgical ligation because again the morbidity mortality rates, rates are very low there would be some report of people doing device and coil closure in these fish in these preterm neonates but i'm not sure if it is a good idea because you might compromise the vein of the baby or the artery of the baby or the device may project into the aorta and cause partial obstruction of aorta so it is safer to go for ligation in preterm babies rather than doing it in the lab again if there is a preterm baby there's no data to say that prophylactic indomethacin or ibuprofen therapy should be used it should only be used if you have diagnosed and and documented a pda in these babies coming to obstructive lesions i think these are relatively simple for example coarctation of aorta i think the conventional indications are gradient of more than 20 or there is ventricular dysfunction with significant coarctation even if the gradient is less than 20 because we know that in presence of left ventricular dysfunction one may underestimate the uh, the coarct gradient as far as patients who have upper limb hypertension or left ventricular hypertrophy they they are soft indications for intervention most of the time we don't intervene we follow them up and intervention is definitely not indicated if the gradient is less than 20 normal ventricular function and there is no upper limb hypertension so this is really not an indication so having a mild coag with not much gradient is not an indication again just diagnosing on echocardiography with little gradient i would not like to intervene because every intervention has a small amount of risk there may be some dissection there may be some aneurysm formation so we should not you know mess with it we should leave it alone how do we uh, how what do we do for coarctation if it is a neonate i would say even if it is a neonate or an infant less than 3 months then surgery is the preferred mode of intervention patients who are critically ill and the surgeons feel that it is a very high risk case for surgery then they may you may tide over the crisis by balloon angioplasty but remember very high restenosis rates are seen with balloon intervention although surgery also has re uh, has restenosis but the, but balloon is almost you know 80 to 90% of these babies will become uh, restenosed and you will have to again uh, intervene so the ideal way is to go is to do surgery but again in some setting you may end up doing balloon angioplasty native coarctation in infants and children under 25 kilo again one can go either for surgery or balloon angioplasty but when it comes to recoarctation or restenosis following surgery then balloon angioplasty is the best way to go and they really respond very well older children with native coarctation or with recoarctation it may be good to think about stenting because these are bigger children you can put a big size stent and therefore one should go with balloon dilatation but one should be ready to stent these patients however there may be certain cases where you cannot put a stent 
and surgery is not an option, then balloon angioplasty would still be the choice for these patients. Elective stenting of aorta would be best avoided in children less than 10 years of age, that is less than 25 kilo. You can have a stent on the shelf that in case of any complication, one can use it. But again, it is best avoided because you'll end up using a smaller size stent, which will become inadequate for that patient when the child grows up. Covered stents, uh, I think a lot of people have started to use covered stent, but there are specific indications for using a covered stent. One should not just you know, replace the normal bare metal stent with a covered stent because covered stent it's, has its own problem. So we should only use it in cases where you think there may be some injury to the aorta or there is an aneurysm or a pseudo aneurysm. Only then a covered stent is indicated. Sometimes we use a covered stent when there is a PDA and coarctation because if you put a covered stent, you can take care of both these conditions, PDA as well as coarctation. But one must have a good anatomy to put a covered stent because you cannot cover subclavian with a covered stent. Otherwise, the blood supply to the subclavian will, uh, will be compromised. Aortic stenosis, again, if there is LV, dilate, uh, LV dysfunction, there is no question. One has to go and do balloon dilatation irrespective of the gradient. But if patient is asymptomatic, with a gradient which is, uh, or even symptomatic, with a gradient to more than 64, with a mean gradient of more than 40, even if LV function is normal, one can go ahead and do balloon dilatation. So these are same indications as we use in adults. Patients who are symptomatic or is ECG is showing some STT changes, it may be better to dilate them even at a lesser gradient. But most of the time, well, Balloon dilatation should not be done in children who are asymptomatic and have a gradient of less than 40. They are best left alone. Uh, or, or less than 64 peak or less than 40 millimeters of mercury mean gradient. Pulmonary balloon dilatation will be a little more liberal and one would do pulmonary valve balloon dilatation in anybody who has a gradient of more than 50 because we know the results are very good. Reintervention rates are not very high. And of course, if there is atrial cord dysfunction, you will immediately intervene. And this becomes a problem sometimes in neonates. When they, when they present to us, they have a very poor right ventricle. So it's a difficult procedure, but one has to go ahead and do it. Sometimes we have done balloon dilatation in, in neonates and infants who have a right ventricular hypoplasia. And we do it thinking that the right ventricle will start growing if you do balloon dilatation in them. So even with less gradient, if the RV is a little small, one can try doing balloon dilatation and the RV might start to grow. This is a, a group of cyanotic heart disease, which I think is more important. And I'm going to spend uh, maybe a little more time on this. So we start with this case of six month old male child who's full term uh, presenting with cyanosis from early infancy, which is increasing with crying. There is history of recurrent spells for the last two months, but again, there is no history suggestive of congestive heart failure in the form of suck, rest, suck cycle or feeding diaphoresis. There's also no history of recurrent lower respiratory infections. Examination says, uh, shows that he's a bit tachycardic, but he's not in distress. Pulses are good. Saturation is only 72%. Apex is in fifth intercostal space, almost at the right place. There is no left parasternal heave. However, second heart sound is single and loud. And what is important is a loud grade three over six ejection systolic murmur in the pulmonary area. X-ray shows absence of cardiomegaly and pulmonary oligemia, as you can see, quite black lung fees. So I think we know the diagnosis uh, in this particular case. This is the ECG showing northwest axis with right ventricular hypertrophy. And the echo just gives the total diagnosis immediately. There's a large subaortic VSD, aortic override, and there is pulmonary stenosis, gradient of almost 64. So we know that this child is having tetralogy of fallows, which is the commonest cyanotic heart disease in, a, in a anybody more than one year of age. So how do we manage this patient? The first thing to remember is that all tetralogy patients require surgical repair irrespective of their saturation. So so-called pink tetralogy also needs to be operated because their right ventricle is facing systemic pressure. However, we have to medically manage them first for the time being, because especially if they are having spells, so we must make sure that they are not anemic. We must have their hemoglobin more than 14 or 15 gram percent because anemia could be one reason which is precipitating or precipitating a spell in these patients. Uh, beta blockers should be gradually increased and possibly given in highest order in doses. You can monitor the heart rate and one can go as much as four milligram per kilogram per day in two or three divided doses. And if it is a newborn presenting with deep cyanosis, one may use prostaglandin infusion for keeping the ductus open so that their saturation is maintained. However, as I said, all these patients need to be operated. And our policy is usually that if they are 
If they are stable, minimally cyanos, we would repair them at six months to one year of age. But then I'm sure there'll be centers which are happy to do neonatal repair uh, you know, in, in less than three months age also. But most of the centers in India would uh, go for a systemic to pulmonary arterial shunt if the child is presenting very early, less than three months of age with deep cyanosis or history of spell and go for uh, total repair little later, more than three to four months of age. But as I said, if the anatomy is good, one can go ahead and do even neonatal repair. That's totally up to the institution's policy, also the results of a particular surgeon. I, I don't think there's any harm in first doing a BT shunt, letting the child grow a little, and then doing a total correction, maybe at one, one and a half or two years of age. I don't think we lose anything by doing that, especially if our mortality of total repair at an earlier age is higher. So one can sort of stage the therapy, a shunt followed by total correction. These are some specific instances, for example, tetralogy with absent pulmonary valve. These are best not dealt with in the neonatal, neonatal period. It's better to keep them medical therapy till one, one and a half, two years of age, followed by total correction because their lungs are quite immature. Their respiratory tree is quite um, soft and they tend to get into a lot of problems. So one would like to wait, let them settle down and then do total correction. And of course, their pulmonary arteries are very large and aneurysmal. So one has to repair that. The other problem that we sometimes see is a tetralogy with anomalous left anterior descending artery coming from right coronary artery and is crossing the RVOT. And so these are the children which may require a conduit placement during surgery. Again, here, it will be better to give them an autopulmonary like a BT shunt if they are small. Once they're a little bigger, one can do a total repair using a conduit. Why conduit? Because giving them a, a, a transandulous patch seems very difficult if this is the anatomy that LAD is crossing the RCA. So you can't really give an incision into the RVOT. You would rather do, do use a conduit from right ventricle to pulmonary artery. And one should have a good sized weight of the child for giving a conduit so that you can give a decent sized conduit to these patients. VSD pulmonary disease is a bit of a complex disease. One has to think of, you know, there are certain important considerations one has to look, or look at in the anatomy. Firstly, most of these patients will have a lot of MAPCAs or you know, AP collaterals or aortobundary collaterals. So one has to be sure that what is the percentage of lung parenchyma being supplied by the central pulmonary arteries. It is possible that central pulmonary arteries are supplying one part and the upper lobe and the lower lobe is being supplied by collaterals. So here you can't really sacrifice these collaterals because then the supply to the lung parenchyma is going to suffer. Also, presence of pulmonary, confident pulmonary arteries of adequate size. Like this one is a very nice pulmonary artery. It is like a membranous pulmonary artery. You even have a main pulmonary trunk. So RV is going to be RVOT is going to be here. Now these are very easy to treat patients because they are almost like tetralogy. The RVOT and the main pulmonary artery are very close to each other. The pulmonary arteries are good size. So this is the simplest pulmonary atresia. Some people call it type A pulmonary atresia. But when it comes to complex pulmonary atresias like this one or this one, then you have to you, you have to do things like unifocalization of pulmonary arteries because you have to use these for, for sort of making the pulmonary artery branches. And then there could be problems because you may have stenosis in these collaterals and that may make the overall uh, you know, anatomy very, very difficult to treat. However, when they present in neonatal life, the, the best therapy is to start them on PGE1 infusion, prostaglandin infusion to keep their ductus open and then take them through for a little longer period. If you want to operate within three, four, six months of life, it is better to give them a BT shunt and then do a conduit surgery later. Instead of BT shunt, one can also stent a PDA uh, in the cath lab. Repair is best done about three, four years of age because you're going to give a conduit. And again, you want to give a good pulmonary artery, good size pulmonary artery conduit from RV to PA so that it is, you know, not to be, it is not required to change this conduit frequently. Yes, uh, instead of a BT shunt, one can do a, uh, a PDS stenting in the cath lab. And we do that sometimes in, uh, you know, in newborns or in few, you know, neonates up to one month of life or so. But I think important point to remember, you can do it. Technically, it is possible. Important point to remember is that you're probably going to give three millimeter stent. Whereas if you do a BT shunt, you could probably give them four millimeter BT shunt. So this stent does not last very long. So if you're thinking of taking them through to three years or four years, then stent may not be a good idea. It may be better to actually give them a good size BT shunt so that it takes them through for next couple of years. And then you can do a total correction in these patients. 
there are certain other tetralogy physiologies like double outlet and ventricle, et cetera, where you can do two ventricle repair, but the repair is a little difficult because either it requires a conduit or it requires some sort of a baffling inside the ventricle. And therefore, it is better again to, to wait till about one to two years of age or even three, four years if you need to use a conduit. And before that, if the patient is turning very blue, one may have to again do pulmonary uh, BT shunt or a systemic to pulmonary artery shunt. So this is a, uh, you know, uh, algorithm that I want to show you for a double outer right ventricle, which is almost next common cyanotic heart disease uh, after tetralogy of fallows. Double outer right ventricle is a kind of a spectrum of a, of a disease or a spectrum of an anatomy. You may have a subaortic VSD, you may have a subpulmonic VSD, you may have a doubly committed VSD, or you may have a remote VSD. So if it is a subaortic VSD with pulmonary stenosis, I think it behaves very much like a tetralogy of fallows, and therefore our management also is like that. If a small child, then can do a BT shunt or an aortopulmonary shunt. If it is an older child, or if the child is stable, then one can electively repair around six to 12 months of age, something that we said for tetralogy of fallows also, because here the double outer right ventricle is because both great arteries are coming out of right, right ventricle, at least more than 50% of both great arteries. However, the VSD is subaortic and therefore easy to close. On the other hand, you may have a subpulmonic VSD with pulmonary stenosis. That's a little difficult because this almost behave like, behaves like a transposition with VSD. PS. So if the pulmonary stenosis is valvular, then it is better to do this kind of a complex surgery like rev or rastily. However, if pulmonary stenosis is subvalvular and the pulmonary valve is spared, then one can go ahead and do arterial switch operation and resect the subpulmonary anastomosis. So what happens basically the pulmonary valve becomes the aortic valve and the aortic valve becomes the pulmonary valve. This is what you do in arterial switch operation. As the VSD is subpulmonic, so it behaves very much like a transposition. So these children are going to be much more blue than these children. And if the pulmonary valve is spared, best is to give them arterial switch operation, good two ventricle repair. And this one will obviously have a much better result in the long term. The other group is that of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So here you have a subaortic VSD like this one, but there is no PS. It is pulmonary arterial hypertension. Usually the VSD is large. And again, you have to treat them more like a VSD rather than anything else. So if it is a subaortic VSD, it is easy to close. Better to do VSD closure right in the beginning. However, if the child is presenting at two years, three years of age, then again, one has to test whether the child is operable or not because there'll be severe pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. You can test it in the cath lab. You can sort of see the whole clinical data. If the child is operable, go for VSD closure. It will be almost similar to what the conventional subaortic VSDs are, you know, how they are closed. However, if patient's operability is in doubt, then better to leave them alone and follow them up. The other group is subpulmonic VSD like this one, but with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Here, as I said, they are going to behave more like a TGA. So go for an arterial switch operation with the VSD closure, unless the child is presenting late, where again, you have to test for operability. So this group, subpulmonic VSD and sub, subpulmonic VSD here are going to be like TGA, whereas this is going to be like VSD, this is going to be like a tetralogy of fallows. Sometimes we have something called toxic Bing anomaly, where you have subpulmonic VSD with pulmonary arterial hypertension and coarctation of aorta or even interruption of aorta. If any of these is present, then must be repaired at the time of AS. So you can't really leave it because if we leave this, the results are not going to be good. The other problem is double outlet right ventricle with a remote VST. Then again, one has to think in terms of a univentricular palliation or the single ventricle pathway, which I'll come to. Transposition of great arteries. I think uh, these patients present very early in life, sometimes within the first couple of weeks, and they need to be stabilized. So there are two ways of stabilizing them. One is to start prostaglandin infusion to make their PDA flow, and that will improve their, uh, their saturation. The other is to do balloon atrial septostomy. You create an AST and you allow the mixing to happen across the AST. And this is almost like a life-saving procedure. Now we have prostaglandin, but I remember maybe 20, 25 years ago, we never had prostaglandin. So we had to go ahead and do balloon septostomy as soon as the baby arrives in the emergency. It is best done in the first four or five weeks of life, but sometimes we do it because our patients present late often. So we can do it even up to two months, two and a half months of life. 
the current the classical indication is tga with intact ventricular septum because these are the patients who are very sick and very hypoxemic and they improve dramatically with balloon septostomy but we also very often do in patients who have a vsd or a pda because the surgery may not be possible to do it immediately for logistic reasons or the child is having sepsis or child is having infection like a pneumonia and therefore these patients are again uh, are better off if you do septostomy and then wait for surgery so many of our patients with vsd also undergo balloon septostomy while they are waiting for surgery because of the comorbid conditions that they come with how do you manage them in the long run if it is intact ventricular septum again if the patient ideally presenting in the first month of life go for arterial switch operation the best conventional operation with very good long term results however if patient presents late then again it's an institutional policy in my institute they would rather do an arterial switch operation with the support of extra corporeal membrane oxygenator that is ecmo sometimes in the past we've also done that with two stage operation but i think in many institutions if they are presenting beyond 2 3 months of life they might like to go for a atrial switch operation which is sending or mustard but most of our surgeons are pretty aggressive and they would rather go for a arterial switch operation even if they have to put the patient on ecmo for initial first week or so but uh, it's again it's a policy of the institution whether you want to go for atrial switch or not i think we know that the result of atrial switch are inferior to that of arterial switch and therefore as far as possible one should go for arterial switch rather than atrial switch those presenting with vsd and pda again we need to quickly go for surgery for them with arterial switch operation with ventricular septal defect closure or pda ligation and here the issue is not much of left ventricle so there is no urgency about it because left ventricle will remain prepared because of the presence of a large vsd if there is an aortic arch association then again these patients are pretty sick and they should be operated as soon as possible the 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 other group of tga is that of tetralogy like physiology that is tga vsd ps here again if it is subvalvular one can think about doing an arterial switch operation and remove the lvot resection or do the uh, do the resection of the left and cloud for tract but if it is a valvular obstruction then one has to go the path of tetralogy that is give a bt shunt and then do one of these operations if it is not possible to root the vsd or to root the aorta to the left ventricle then one may end up doing the single ventricle pathway if the vsd is non rootable and the single ventricle pathway is also given for all univentricular hearts like tricuspid atresia single ventricle or non rootable vsd as we just discussed the single when i say univentricular heart single ventricle pathway means that you give them a glen where you do svc to rp anastomosis maybe a, before one year of age or so and this should be followed by a fontan maybe at 4 5 years of age where you also bring in inferior vena cava in line with the pulmonary artery so you totally segregate the deoxygenated blood from the body and only the oxygenated blood goes into the single ventricle so this particular ventricle is supplying the systemic as well as pulmonary circulation so this is called fontan and there are a lot of modifications of fontan if patient is presenting earlier than 4 to 6 months then one should go for a bt shunt first and then wait and then go for a glen however there is a caveat here every time we see a patient of a vent of a univentricular heart where we know that two ventricle is not possible it is important for the family to understand that the long term results are not going to be normal long term results are going to be suboptimal and there is a commitment from the family not just for the bt shunt they need to go for glen they need to go for fontan so it's an ongoing problem also we know that fontan also fails after maybe one or two decades or three decades so it's not like a normal life and that is what is very very important for us to counsel our families and i'm sure it will be very important for your part of the world also because the families need to be committed for the treatment of their child for the entire life which is something that they need to understand right in the beginning and i i can tell you that there will be about 20% of our families who would refuse right in the beginning saying that no we don't want to take this path and therefore we don't want any treatment but that is better than rather than you know doing getting one treatment and then not coming back because then there is a problem you know you've done a bt shunt they don't come back for glen you've done a glen they don't come back for fontan so how do we treat univentricular heart i think the most important factor over here is pulmonary artery pressure a glen or a fontan cannot work cannot work if the pa pressure is not normal or the pvri is not low 
because we know this is a passive flow that is going from superior vena cava. So if PA pressure is any high, the flow will not happen like this flow will happen in the other direction. So it is very, very important to have a normal PA pressure. And therefore, our algorithm of univentricular heart depends totally on the presence of PS. If there is no PS, you have to make PS. You have to create PS by giving a PA band, whether a child comes early or child comes late. The only issue is that if child comes late, they may not be very suitable for a PA band because of high pulmonary vascular resistance. So somehow we have to make sure that the PA pressure falls down. And then once the PA pressure is normalized, one can go for a Glen and a Fontan pathway that we just talked about. So must very, very important to make to ensure that as soon as they are born, if they have pH, we must band them within three months or four months of life to make their pH pressure go down. So many of these patients may require procedures like AV valve repair, atrial septectomy, TAPVC, because these are associations with single ventricle and they need to be done at the time of Glenfontan procedure. Finally, some uh, conditions like TAPVC, Every patient of TAPVC needs to be operated. If it is obstructive, they will present very early and one has to go for almost an emergency surgery. This is one condition where one should not use prostaglandins because prostaglandins can actually make them worse. Otherwise, any TAPVC who is non-obstructive, they should be operated as soon as they present. There's no question about you know, calling them back at six months or seven months or something. It's not such a you know, big deal. Surgeons are quite comfortable doing it and the results are generally very good. However, who present patients who present late where there is significant pulmonary arterial hypertension, like during adult life, again, you need to check for their pulmonary vascular resistance. Truncus arteriosus, again, surgery is indicated in all. Generally, we would say early surgery if there is uncontrolled heart failure, even in the first four weeks of life. However, if the patient is doing well, one can even wait about six or eight weeks of life. Earlier, we used to do something called bidirectal pulmonary artery bending, which is now practically not done. It is just reserved for complex cases where you cannot put them on CPP. And again, those presenting late, if they have severe pulmonary artery hypertension, which all the truncuses have, then one should be very sure that they are not developed pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. Otherwise, the surgery will be contraindicated in these patients. Epstein's anomaly, to just complete the list, intravenous prostaglandin infusion if they're presenting in neonatal life. I would not like to operate on them as far as possible. However, we may be pushed to operate some of the neonates if they're not stabilized with medical therapy. They have high mortality of whatever surgery you do. However, in older children, one can think about doing something like cone repair, which is the, usually the way to go for Epstein's anomaly. So not for all, but any patient who is having an indication like decreasing exercise capacity, cyanosis, progressive cardiomegaly, paradoxical embolism, or some dysfunction of right ventricular and echo, one should think about doing surgery for these patients. Rest can be left alone on a medical follow-up. Another indication that may be important is arrhythmias. And if there is only arrhythmia in patients, otherwise asymptomatic, one can actually take them to the cath lab and do ablation uh, rather than putting them for surgery. So just to uh, recapitulate what we talked about, cyanotic heart disease, we can divide them into four groups with pulmonary stenosis, severe pulmonary artery hypertension, normal pulmonary artery pressure, and severe pulmonary artery hypertension with pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. So when it comes to pulmonary stenosis, we should see their anatomy, whether it is a biventricular repair or a univentricular repair. If it is a biventricular repair, like a tetralogy, conduit not required, you can go ahead and either do a PT shunt or do total intracardiac repair. However, if there is a conduit required, like in cases of some of the cases of double outer right ventricle, again, you should wait for a couple of years and then do a total repair, maybe at two or three years of age. Before that, you can do a BT shunt or an aortopulmonary shunt. For the univentricular heart, again, if they are very small, do a first shunt, but if they are a little bigger, you can straight away go for a Glen procedure. Ultimately, these patients will all go for Fontaine surgery, which is best in around five or six years of age. Patients who have severe pulmonary artery hypertension, again, you have to decide whether they are univentricular or biventricular. If they are univentricular, the first thing is to, to make their pressure low by giving the pulmonary artery bend and then go for Glen and Fontaine. However, if they, are, if they are fit for biventricular repair like transposition, then best is to go ahead and do an arterial switch operation or repair of the TAPVC or repair of the truncus, again, very early so that they don't develop Eisenmenger syndrome or a pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. Normal PA pressure, we just talked of Epstein. There are some specific indications where you should deal, where you should operate. Otherwise, you can leave them alone. The last group is that of Eisenmenger syndrome. And we know that 
many of these patients of large flow will ultimately go on to this group, unfortunately. And here we really don't have much to offer them at this stage and therefore they are best left alone. So the, the examples of the first group are TOF, DORV. The second group is VSD pulmonary atresia, TGA, VSD, PS. This is single ventricle, as I told you, Fontaine surgery, corrective surgery for TGA, TF, BBC, truncus. And of course, nothing for Eisenmenger syndrome. So to conclude, the take home messages are that elective surgery is required for ASDs, most of the VSDs, patent ductus, coarctation of aorta, some of the stable tetralogy of fellows who have a good saturation and univentricular hearts with pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, not with pulmonary arterial hypertension. However, early intervention may be required if there are symptoms like recurrent LRTIs, poor weight gain in a patient of moderate to large VST, or there is something like aortic regurgitation, or there is congestive heart failure, or patient develops ventricular dysfunction, severe pulmonary arterial hypertension, severe cyanosis and hypoxia, and pulmonary venous hypertension, like in obstructive TAPVC. An emergency intervention will be required for obstructive TAPVC, critical aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis with an associated ventricular dysfunction, severe coarctation with LD dysfunction, that means severe obstructive lesions with ventricular dysfunction, or if there is severe hypoxia, like spell, cyanotic spell, you should not wait. You should try and stabilize them. And even if it is required to do a BT shunt, one should take them for a BT shunt. Or TGA with intact ventricular septum. And here, one can use prostaglandins, or one can do, use a balloon septostomy to stabilize them, and then send them for an arterial switch operation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. It's a very wonderful one. Very wonderful. And I have been benefited from the directions you have given. And now I would like to ask question from the audience. If there is any question from anybody, then we'll go for the comment. Is there any question from anyone? There is one. It says the coarctation is it the mean gradient or the peak gradient. So in coarctation, we take the peak gradient. And I think more important, uh, filling of the gradient in diastole. So you, when you are taking the gradient, it is filling into diastole. So that is what is very, very important to call it significant uh, obstruction in a coarctation. So you can ask question one by one. Please remain mute, everyone. And those who is asking question can unmute only. Assalamu uh, alaikum, ma'am. It is nice to hear you from life. I want to know just that there are some syndromic babies in which the sometimes surgery is deferred. Uh, for which regions the parents can be counseled in these cases? So, uh, you know, long time ago when I started my where we would, we would counsel them a little bit against it. But now over the years, I think Down syndrome is something that we can deal with and we usually encourage them to undergo surgery. Because we know that the results of surgery, especially if done, done early, are good. And also, the, you know, there are a lot of support now for Down syndrome babies in the other disciplines also. So that, that is something we have changed significantly. Uh, Edward syndrome is something that we usually avoid them because we know the results of Edward syndrome are not uh, very good. So Edward syndrome, we usually discourage them surgery would be heterotaxy syndrome. So if, if, if the child has heterotaxy, asplenia, right isomerism with uh, unbalanced ABSD, with uh, uh, you know, TAPVC, et cetera, I, we usually discourage them. I wouldn't say that we say no, but we usually discourage them. Most of the patients uh, would agree, but there are some patients who still want it to be done. So that is the other group. Otherwise, of the syndromic babies, I think Nunans, uh, you know, this uh, vectoral syndrome, all these we are going ahead and operating on. I mean, we, we are not discouraging them, really. 
Assalamualaikum. Thank you, ma'am, uh, ma'am Amit uh, and Dr. Santos uh, from National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease, uh, Eastern Professor Pediatric Cardiology. I, I I want to ask you a question regarding the uh, neonat present with uh, severe percussion of aorta with LV dysfunction. Uh, what are the precautions should be taken during the balloon for the shape for the posture and uh, role of uh, inotrope in such a case? What I would do is I would start prostaglandin in this baby because it's a neonate. It's possible that you can open the PDA and you know stabilize the baby a little bit. So we usually would start prostaglandin on such babies. And uh, you know if the child is not improving, then we have to you know intervene. And our approach is usually surgery for neonates with coarctation because whatever patients we have done balloon dilatation, we found it to be very very. Uh, you know, high rates of pre-stenosis. Sometimes within the hospital, within two or three weeks, they develop pre-stenosis and you have to go ahead and operate on them. So we would prefer to do surgery. However, you may have a situation where a surgeon is not ready or the child is enuric. You know, that's the other time. Sometimes they're so enuric that the surgeon doesn't want to take them. Then we'll take them for balloon angioplasty. We've been conventionally doing from the femoral artery, although there are people doing from axillary artery also. But we do conventionally from femoral artery. We I think doing the procedure is not difficult. One has to use a, a balloon of the appropriate size so that you don't produce any injury to the aorta because you don't want to put a stent in a neonate. So we sort of dilate them with the appropriate size balloon. But our main concern is about losing the femoral artery. So we empirically, or let's say we prophylactically put them on heparin as soon as the procedure is done so that their artery remains open and we keep a very close watch on the artery. We try and get Doppler done. And if we find any evidence the artery is getting compromised, we sometimes have done even surgery for, you know, embolectomy. But that is our main concern because these patients will require recurrent interventions. And if we lose their femoral artery, then there is a big problem next time. Uh, so that's the main precaution. And of course, not using a large balloon. Good evening. Good evening. Can I ask a question? Uh, good evening. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, good evening, ma'am. This is uh, Dr. Ashfaq. My question uh, to you is that uh, how long maximum we can wait for surgery after PD stenting cases? And another question is that uh, even uh, the, the, uh, small, uh, the children less than 10 years or 11 years having low saturation in case of Epstein anomaly, but the, sur the surgeons are differing for cone repair. So what will be the guideline for those cases? So uh, I think there are, uh, as far as stenting question is concerned, I would say that usually in our own practice, the stent usually don't last beyond four or five months. And this is the literature also. When you see the patients who have undergone it, there's a very nice paper which talks about BT shunt versus PDS stenting comparison. And what the difference is mainly that patients who've had a stent keep on undergoing interventions, whereas those who've had a BT shunt don't have so many interventions. So that is the only difference between the two, that a stent may last four months, five months. So our policy at our institute is that if the baby is for a fontan or a Glen kind of repair, we will do stent because then we can push the patient for a Glen at four or five months of age. However, if we are doing it for BSD pulmonary atresia, where we know that we require this source of supply till about two years or three years of age, we would not do it. We would ask our surgeon to do a BT shunt and maybe give a four mm shunt instead of a three mm stent. And that may last one or one and a half or two years sometimes. So our policy is that univentricular palliation, we will do a BT shunt because we know we probably will go on for four or five months. But if it is a two ventricle repair where a conduit is required, then we would not do a uh, stent, we would rather get a BT shunt done. What was your second question? Sorry. My question was uh, regarding the cone repair. Yeah. Uh, so I think for Epstein, yeah. So for Epstein, I, I, cone repair is considered to considered to be the best, but you're absolutely right. There are surgeons who are not, uh, or, or let's say there are anatomies which are not very suitable for cone repair. And therefore, one cannot really sort of predict that every child of Epstein and Abley can have a cone repair. So I think if you're thinking in terms of a difficult repair, your, your, your uh, you know, uh, the bar for sending such patient for surgery may be a little high. What we are generally doing is that we are getting most of these patients an MRI done by which we derive RV volume. And if we find that RV volume is good, then we would go for a cone repair. If we realize, if we find that RV volume is functional RV, is small, then sometimes they would do a repair, but add a glint to it. 
so they'll do an spc to pn osteomosis making like a one and a half ventricle repair uh, however i mean all epstein need not be operated but if there is desaturation less than say 90% earlier it used to be 85% cut off now we are taking 90% it is best to send them for some kind of surgery um, thank you madam i am dr narima from national heart foundation uh, it's a brilliant presentation and you have covered the, all the spectra thank you madam my i have two patient that i am following and i am i am happy to ask you this question one patient i am following from one month this patient is tricuspid atresia uh, with uh, inner normally related great artery with unprotected pa but unfortunately this baby has severe lv dysfunction oh. so at that time i have given anti failure therapy and i am measuring clinically and lv dis- lv function echocardiographically and also by pro uh, pro bnp but unfortunately the baby functionally improved but the lv function not improved at all and also pro bnp is raising and now the baby is four and a half month so this unprotected pa i am difficult that i can go for uh, pd glen or these things so what will be your uh, advice for this patient and i have second question can i ask or uh, you will answer and i will ask that okay so let me answer this one i think this is a very difficult patient i there are no really easy answers for it but my sense would be that you should still go ahead and do a pa band on this patient simply i know it will be a very high risk case and the surgeon sometimes don't agree also but the trouble is that if you can do a band then you will reduce the volume coming to the left ventricle yes so the ventricle which is already dysfunctional it is obviously getting more volume at this point of time if you can band it then the volume to the ventricle will come down and it's possible that this ventricle might improve of course if it doesn't improve or if it stays the same then there's no question about going for glen or fontan then we'll have to go towards you know heart transplantation uh, kind of a trajectory but giving a chance with the pa band especially if the saturations are still more than 90% maybe a good choice thank you madam and my second question is uh, we are seeing one patient uh, he is a uh, four and half month weighing a uh, 5 kg and the patient is saturation 60 to 65 and this patient is diagnosed membranous pulmonary atresia with pda dependent circulation with intact ivs with uh, asd 3 to 5 mm with bidirectional shunt predominantly right to left this patient also have a moderately severe rv dysfunction so the lpa size is around 3 to 4 mm and pda size is also the pulmonary end uh, 3 mm so what will be advised for this child So can I ask you what is the RV size and what is the tricuspid valve annulus? Uh, I, this is four month, uh, four and half month child, and the tricuspid annulus is eleven millimeter, and it is my hypoplastic uh, in comparison to LB. Okay. Uh, LB is uh, around thirteen mm, I think, and uh, my okay. tricuspid is ten to eleven mm. mm. And there is no BST, you said. Intact IBS, yes. Okay, so this is a patient who has a. practically good rv despite having an intact ventricular septum is that correct rv is moderately compromised means rv is hi- no, no. i'm saying size size wise size is uh, mildly hypoplastic right right so i think since it is a membranous pulmonary atresia so the first thing we have to do is to open the valve unless we open the valve the rv may not come back because the you know obviously rv is pumping at a very high pressure it's likely that the rv pressure is suprasystemic it is possible because of the pulmonary atresia so there are two ways of doing it if it is membranous pulmonary atresia you can actually take him to the lab and perforate the valve with maybe uh, you know one of those cto wires that's what we do we published also our data that we perforate the membranous pulmonary atresias with a cto wire like a, you know whichever you, your adult cardiology colleagues are comfortable with so you perforate the valve do a balloon dilatation make some way out of the right ventricle and hope the right ventricle will improve uh, it, the other option could be to 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 stent the pda but that is not going to decompress the right ventricle that is the yes. problem and right ventricle dysfunction means and if you want to use this right ventricle for future which seems to be usable then it is better to decompress the right ventricle first if it is not successful in the lab then one can think about doing it in the in the operation theater by putting in you know rvot patch on top of it uh 
the the only uh, worry is that uh, you know if you give too much pulmonary regurgitation to this patient then the right ventricle may you know not take it very well so you have to have a controlled kind of dilatation where you do a little dilatation let the right ventricle recover and then of course do um, you know uh, more repair one thing that you will need to rule out is to make sure that there is no rv dependent coronary circulation before you decompress the rv because if there is an rv dependent collateral circ coronary circulation then decompressing the rv will produce myocardial ischemia so that is something you will have to rule out by doing an rv angio at the time of cath thank you madam thank you madam this is dr shamsuddin from national thank you Heart i Foundation. think we we spent a lot of time is there any question any question from anyone uh, dr shamsuddin from national heart foundation just yes, a simple yes, one, one question. Uh, yes. What is the age limit, madam, for your institute for PA bending in case of VHD, multiple VHD severe pH, and in case of uh, single ventricle pathway, this is unprotected PA in single ventricle situation. What is the upper so, limit of uh, for age. PA bending? Yeah, so I, I wouldn't set any upper limit. I think most of our patients should have a PA band uh, within three months of life. But I can tell you any number of examples, especially of the VSD, not TG, the VSD, where the patient remains operable even till six or nine months of age. So I'm going to just look at the patient's clinical profile. And if I find that patient is still operable, the PA band can be done even at six months, seven months of life. We've had patients who've been banded at trichospiratory, I remember, who was banded at one hour, 15 months of life. So I think saturation in a patient of transposition that means TGA, trichospirate reserve, and malpose great arteries. If you have a saturation which is to the tune of 90% or more, you could go ahead and do a PA band because we know after PA band, the saturation is going to fall. So even if it falls to 85 or something, patient is going to be okay for the next stage of surgery, which is Glenfontan. However, if the saturation is already 85% or 80%, then B band may not be a good idea because then the saturation is going to fall more and the patient will become more blue. But generally, I would say a safe limit would be about three months. You can operate on a TG or a DORB till about three months, do a band or a single ventricle. However, in case of multiple VSDs or a large simple VSD without you know, malposition, this age may be six months. You know, patient may remain operable till six months also. Thank you. Ma'am, Sar has asked one question in the chat box that, uh, that you have showed a uh, palm, um, MAPCA and a native pulmonary supplying the lung. So how right. cite the uh, single supply and dual supply? Can, uh, right. do, uh, so generally what we are doing is we're doing a CT angio in them. And on CT angio, we try and uh, trace the pulmonary arteries and, and the collaterals. So in general, most of these cases where there are good sized pulmonary arteries, they'll be dual supply. Most of the time, there will be dual supply. That means the uh, MAPCA as well as pulmonary arteries would be supplying. So there is no problem in those cases. You can compromise on those uh, collaterals. However, if the pulmonary arteries are, arteries are very small, then it is likely that they're not supplying all the segments. Generally, it is believed that if pulmonary arteries are supplying 80% of the lung parenchyma, that is good enough for, 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 for the AP streets to be compromised. Generally, that is the rule. So out of, let us say, 14 or six, I think 16 segments, if 14 are being supplied or 13 are being supplied by the native pulmonary artery, that's good enough. And you need not worry about the MAPCAs. But if, if there is a single supply, then that MAPCA has to be used to make the native pulmonary artery branch or to, to connect to the native pulmonary artery branch. Next segment is supplied, uh, do you decide with CT angiogram or cardiac? Yes. CT. No, no, cardiac is not a good way. CT angio yes. will profile the MAPCAS and the pulmonary artery together. You can't do that at cardiac death. Okay. So you have Thank to have dye in both of them, in the MAPCA as well as in the native pulmonary artery together to see whether they are reaching the periphery of the lungs or not. Okay. Thank but, you. Uh, how, how, madam, how to determine how much area is supplied by MAPCA? Can we determine from city? Yeah, yeah, you can, because you can see the branching of MAPCA. In fact, MAPCAs are very well seen on CT. You even can find out if there's a stenosis in the MAPCA. So all that is much better seen in uh, in uh, CT. Because when you do cardiac catheterization, the dye may go in the aorta only. You may not be able to hook each and every collateral. So the information on, on collaterals 
may not be very good on uh, on uh, cardiac catheterization. All our patients with pulmonary atresia undergo CT. All of them, CT angio. Ma'am, I'm sorry, ma'am. In CT angiogram, whenever we see the MAPCA, the, we just can trace the MAPCA why it is crossing behind the bronchial. There is a bronchus or esophagus. Then it is just entering the lungs, right or left, something like that. Right. But how can you detect the which area is supplied by the MAPCA in CT angiogram? I'm not Be sure, madam. Because you you need to follow that branch of MAPCA to the mm -hmm. periphery, to the periphery. It will okay. keep branching. Like okay, you know, John, the, John, John, okay. so, so you can actually, like the native pulmonary artery, you can also follow the collateral. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And as okay. you rightly said, collaterals are posterior and pulmonary artery branches are anterior. So that's how you differentiate yeah. in the cross-sectional imaging of CT, which you cannot get at cardiac catheterization. Oh, I see. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, I think we had a lot of questions answered, ma'am. And it was actually a very nice interaction between you and our students and even our pediatric cardiologist and pediatric cardiac surgeon. Uh, just to end up with... Uh, few comments about the MAPCA and it can give better idea about the distribution of the collaterals and about the decision making of unifocalization, whether it can be done or not. But one thing which is good in cardiac catheterization is to measure the pulmonary artery pressure. If it is a hypertensive MAPCA, uh, then we have to sometime we need to do cardiac catheterization I can't hear you properly, ma'am. Yeah, I, I think. Properly, yeah, I think you are so right. Uh, in a little older children, we also do cardiac catheterization. But I was talking more in terms of, let's say, infants and neonates or one year or two year old. Otherwise, for seeing what percentage of lung and arteries. Please. Yes, yes. I mean, I I think I lost you in between, but uh, I agree that uh, we need to do cardiac catheterization to get PA pressure whenever we are suspecting pulmonary arterial hypertension. That is true in older children, not really in young children. Sorry, ma'am. This is Dr. Selim from Ibrahim Cardiac Hospital. It's a very uh, junior pediatric cardiac surgeon. Uh, may I ask you a question? Sure. I'm really impressed with your brilliant presentation. This is really an eye-opening session for all of us joining here. <laughs> Uh, regarding the small VSDs, uh, maybe uh, suppose a seven years old child, small perimembranous VSD, three or two millimeters, something like that. And the chambers are not dilated, peer pressures are normal. And uh, sometimes it is uh, almost covered by the STL. In those cases, what should the decision? Should you go for device closure if it is divisible or surgery or nothing to do? Just watch the patient. So, so I think there's, there are a number of studies that have studied, that have uh, talked about the long-term effect of small VSDs on the ventricle. And there's enough data to say that nothing happens to the ventricle in small VSDs. They remain fine. If there is no left ventricular volume overload, if VSD is one, the PA pressures are normal, there is no infective endocarditis, there is no AR. You should just follow them up. I don't think the indication for device should be any different from the indication for surgery. I mean, they should be exactly the same. So if we are not operating on these small VSD, why should we even put in a device? More so if it is perimembranous VSD, devices are not very good for perimembranous VSD. So best is to leave them alone. I just tell them to maintain, you know, their parents to make sure that the dental hygiene is good. They are sort of brushing their teeth. They are seeing the dentist every year or so and making sure that there are you know, nothing in the oral cavity which can precipitate or which can uh, make them more vulnerable for infective endocarditis. I would just leave them alone. Any intervention, you know, like my first slide, one has to look at the risk of intervention and the result of intervention. I think in these patients who are doing so well, why should we even put them for, for any uh, you know, risk of surgery or device, however small it may be, I wouldn't like to do anything for these patients. I have to make sure, though, that there is no pulmonary arterial hypertension and there is no left ventricular volume overload. Okay, I think we had a lot of question answer session and uh, we, <laughs> we need to conclude now. Before that, um, I must add that
the guidelines which uh, ma'am has presented is uh, on the basis of their national consensus and they are following this guideline in all of their institutes and you have seen the author of the published article article um, she showed at the very first slide and most of the pediatric cardiologists of india they were there so they have and, prepared their and own surgeon, and surgeons and surgeons also and surgeons yeah. also yeah. So they have prepared their own guideline and we are actually we are uh, our country many of the pediatric, pediatric cardiologists and cardiac surgeons they are trained from many centers like some of them from india some of them from middle east from uk from usa so according to our training from our mother institute where we were, we were following those but i think we also need a national consensus and a national guideline because what you mentioned in your presentation about every disease is more or less we are following the same protocol a okay. uh, little bit sometimes like about the pain and ductus arteriosus nowadays we are closing the pda in units also with the devices because if there is um, like intractable heart failure in the newborn and preterm baby we have now small device small delivery system available even we can uh, pass through a 5 french catheter maximum 5 french catheter so we are closing now uh, those newborn who are having intractable heart failure and uh, there are some complications uh, their ventilator depend then for long if we wait pause at 6 month it was like 6 mm at 8 month it is like 8 mm at one year it is getting 10 12 mm so parents for testing are for doing device because they want to do device closer so if the hsd become too large and then it will not be possible in future to do, do the device closer in that cases our age limit we have reduced up to one year and wait up to 8 kg so our country uh, when i have started work in 1998 there were no surgeon for the new born and for many neonatal complex diseases and for the neonatal simple diseases i had to do some intervention because there was no surgeon so i did neonatal coarctation and our we can hear you madam in between you are lost good ma'am we can't hear you anything ma'am interrupted ma'am some of the can you hear me now we can hear before we in between in between we lost your connection okay about the quotation i was telling that including the age in 1998 you are not hearing no. maybe now, you can switch off switch Hello? off you can switch off your video it might be better yeah you are hearing now yes yeah now i think you can start from the asd also oh, from the asd yes yeah, yeah, when we could hear we anything when asd is getting larger in subsequent follow up we even at the age of 1 year when uh, a, a, if the weight is uh, about 8 kg then we are doing the asd device closer just to give them the opportunity to uh, device not uh, not to allow them to go for surgery so about the coarctation i just want to mention that since 1998 and our outcome is very good we had reached coarctation out of maybe 100 sorry ma'am we can't hear you any and there ma'am if you allow ma'am can't hear you ma'am really sorry assalam alaikum ma'am ma'am if you so, allow i can uh, yeah for those you can't hear me yeah ma'am i can tell okay. some uh, on your on your part uh, dr selim can you hear me Yeah, you. I can hear you, but not, ma'am. We could not hear anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm telling. I'm telling. What ma'am wanted to. Okay, okay. Just, just. Uh, if you heard me, 
uh, I will tell in uh, I mean this on behalf of ma'am that in our center uh, we have the experience that in case of ASDs sometimes ASDs are getting larger in subsequent follow up. In that particular case, actually the age limit of the ASD. Uh, what the Onita Saxena ma'am has uh, shown in this slide, okay. the age limit uh, just for our uh, center, uh, sometimes we close the ASD okay. with the device uh, at an earlier age, less than two years of age, weighing uh, more than eight kilo. So this is regarding the ASD and regarding the coarctation of aorta. In our center, we have seen in the new net uh, with intractable heart failure and with the acidosis and uh, when the surgeons are deferring the case for this mm -hmm. corrective, I mean, the, the surgical correction, that time as really we do the, uh, the coarctation of the valvoplasty and our experience is that uh, very few cases, ma'am has said that out of 100 cases, very few uh, came with the re of the coarctation of aorta. And in that particular cases also we have done the, the uh, valvoplasty and then the patients are, are doing well. So that's what actually ma'am wanted to mean that uh, the in case of neonatal coarctation, sometimes we do the valvoplasty and our experience is not bad. The restenosis is not that much. Thank you. Uh, it'll be it'll be good it'll be good if you report that because I think if you see the literature it is full of 80 70 to 80 or 90 percent restenosis after balloon in neonates and it's actually not indicated. Of course, sometimes we have. Oh, we can. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Very. Thank you. So we can conclude our session now. Thank you, ma'am, for your excellent presentation. Uh, and uh, thank you all for attending this seminar. And so I would like to conclude. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Patima. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.